True Story is a documentary podcast powered by the Institute of Documentary Film. You can find news from the world of film on all the common platforms such as iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, as well as on docweb.net. Hi, everybody. I would like to welcome you to the IDF, uh, IDF industry session called Rewriting the Story, a case study of Love is Not an Orange. My name is Anna Kulhankova, and I'm a coordinator of the IDF industry sessions organized by the Institute of Documentary Film in Prague. And I hope that you are all doing fine. And thank you for deciding to spend the upcoming 90 minutes with us. Uh, Love is Not an Orange is for me one of the most touching films that I have seen recently and I'm very honored that the most important people from its creative team agreed to join us today. They are director of the film Otilia Barbara, producer Hanne Filo, uh, Filippo, sorry, and editor of the film Pier Paolo uh, Filomeno. Uh, the film uh, as a project was participating at Ex Oriente Film Workshop in 2017, and it had its world premiere at Doc Leipzig and received uh, just uh, uh, a month ago a Silver Eye Award by the Institute of Documentary Film during Yehlava International Documentary Film Festival. Uh, our session will focus on the whole creative process, uh, how to deal with the film project when you when your initial uh, story changes and you have to start creating a completely new film, how that affects uh, obligations that the producer has uh, while making the whole fundraising uh, strategy, and also what is the role of an editor when the film is composed solely from personal archives, uh, in this case, archives of different families in Moldova. Uh, so of course, many more topics will be discussed today, so feel free to ask questions uh, whenever uh, you have any during the whole session. And now I would like to welcome Natalia Imas, who is the moderator of the session. Natalia has vast experience with film and television in different positions, uh, ranging from writing, directing and produ uh, production. Nowadays, she has her own production company called Parallelum, uh, Parabellum Film and uh, is focusing on documentaries by women filmmakers, new talent, personal stories at the intersection between history and biography and autobiography. Uh, she's interested in personal narratives and socio-political processes. So definitely, Love is Not an Orange is also uh, of a big uh, personal interest uh, for Natalia. Uh, and to all of us who are watching, please, uh, enjoy uh, the session and don't forget to ask questions in the Facebook chat and we will try to reply to as many as possible. Uh, have a good evening and Natalia, floor is yours. In the car. Um, so indeed, I'm very happy that I am moderating this session today because the film really checks a lot of boxes of what I actually love in documentary film. So I'm very happy to be having this conversation with Hane, Otilia and Pia Paolo. And I think we should probably kickstart this session by watching the trailer of the film and having this introduction into the world of Love is Not an Orange. Ne-am câștigat independență, dar ne-am pierdut mame. Am început să plecăm. Una, câte una. Am ajuns în luni din care nu știam când ne vom putea întoarce. Copiii primeau pachet. Iar mamele primeau 
Cassette video. So that was the trailer, Otilia. Congratulations on the film, by the way, and congratulations on the Silver Eye Award. It is, as Hannah said, actually a really deeply moving film. I very much enjoyed watching it. Um, and it's also a very Moldovan story. So maybe um, you can start, let's start at the beginning, at the very, very beginning. Like how did you come up with the idea of the film and how did it start? Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I don't see anybody, but uh, <laughs> that's a bit strange, but, uh, but uh, yes. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I think um, the story somehow came up in um, in, in um, like in in many steps. Let's say um, it started with uh, me growing up as a child with uh, friends that didn't have their mothers next to them, and uh, this was let's say like the first click, um, and then. Um, uh later on when i mean for me the beginning i thought that this is a uh, an a great thing like not to have your mother home but to have a mother that sends you present from somewhere uh but only later on when we actually started talking about it and uh, um actually i started understanding uh how does that really feel and um then I think it was the second moment that uh, something there also got implanted. <laughs> and uh, then I, uh, I think the actual moment when I thought that uh, and I considered making a film about it was when the mother of my best friend came home after 12 years of working abroad and they started living together. And um, I was um, witnessing um, then them not having any any relationship anymore and any uh, anything that can connect them. So it was a mother and a daughter living in the same place um, and having a huge emptiness uh, among them. So I think I think somehow in this moment, I, I don't know, I, I, I was thinking to to give them to to offer them something to to hold on to. And I think that's somehow when, uh, when I decided to make this film. Um, and at, we, when we were talking uh, previously, like in preparation of, of the session today, um, you mentioned that you actually already did um, your short film, graduation film about the same topic. Was your best friend and her mother already involved in that in that project, or was it something that? developed out of that graduation film later on yes they they were uh, the that was uh, when her mother returned back home i started making uh, the this short i started making this short film with them uh, and that's when it started so they they were the the protagonists of my uh, of my graduation short film if i understood it correctly your best friend and her mother are not in the film 
anymore in a way. I mean, they are obviously there as a starting point, but they are not in the footage. How did that um, happen, actually, that at some point you decided to make the film entirely out of archives? Um, was that something that was there quite at the beginning of the process or something that developed over time? Um, I started filming with them um, and I, I did that, that um, throughout around three years. It was, of course, on and off. Uh, it was not a, a constant process. Um, and I had something um, specific in mind. Uh, I wanted to to capture a relationship that is not there. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, to and I was trying to film something that doesn't exist. Um, mm -hmm. I was trying to film a relationship that doesn't exist. But to to film something like that, I think you, you have to understand a lot of things about the past uh, because that's what everything comes from. And um, yeah, I, I think... Um, and it was also a search, uh, you know, uh, it was also a lot of searching of finding a way to make this film. So, um, but yeah, like while, while filming, I realized that it's, it's a lot about the memory of this, um, of this past that uh, made them become estranged. So that I had to search somewhere more, um, more in, in their past. So while I was filming with them, I was also um, talking with uh, other mothers and daughters that went through the same experience. And um, I was making interviews uh, on WhatsApp or uh, um, even on camera or just recording audio and uh, finding about uh, other experience, other mothers and daughters that went through the same. And uh, like this, I found out about the existence of these archives, about these family archives, and that it was actually a thing that people during these uh, 30 years, uh, I mean, it started in the 90s and it it still continues, but in a different shape, uh, yeah. that that it was a thing to, to, to exchange these tapes and that actually more and more people were telling me that we, we have these tapes and we could share them with you. So I thought that maybe like yeah this this is where i should dig deeper and see if there is uh, something there that can help the film yeah and how much how much of of your own personal um background and 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 personal story did flow into that process because you're yourself a multiple filmmaker who actually is uh, also based abroad as so many people in the country so it's a different generation and it's a different background, but it, it is a similar story of, of emigration in a way. And how much of that kind of um, ended up affecting the, the film at that stage? Mm, I think, my, I mean, my story of migration is, I would say, completely different. Uh, um, I left because... Um, it was my choice and I had this choice to stay or to leave. I think these mothers didn't have that choice. They, they, they didn't have the choice to stay. They had to leave. Otherwise uh, their families couldn't survive. And I think it's a different, uh, it's a very different starting migration point. Um, mm -hmm. And it's very different to, to, to migrate, to study and to migrate because you cannot feed your family. So um I think it's a completely different experiences uh, from this point of view. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think my my personal uh, experience in this, it's the experience uh, of my friends. It's the experience of, uh, of what I saw um, and um, of what I witnessed around me throughout my childhood and, uh, and later on that somehow, um, yeah, um, that I could make, uh, yeah, like gather their experiences and, and put it in the film. Yeah, I'm thinking also um, to, to, to bring Hane into the conversation at this point, maybe a little bit, I was thinking 
how much that also maybe played a role in in the in the structure and in the construction of the film production wise um having a moldovan filmmaker which is based out of out of moldova and, and having to navigate that with the fundraising strategy and all of that yeah so maybe just to go back to where it started um i met otilia when i was tutoring at uh, doc nomads which is a school or a collaboration between three film schools uh, in Europe. Um, and so Atilia was doing her semester of um, documentary and doing a short in uh, Brussels. And in that program, I was involved as a, a tutor uh, for uh, the production side of these films. Um, so we started talking uh, there. And then I think, Otilia, you decided after Doc Nomads to... Uh, stay in Brussels and uh, the fund of uh, Belgium doesn't um, allow us uh, unfortunately <laughs> uh, to produce uh, filmmakers that don't uh, live in uh, Belgium or that are not considered as Belgium residents. I think in Denmark for example you can easily uh, produce a director that lives in Moldova or in Romania in Belgium uh, that's uh, not possible except as a minor co-production but the fact that Dottilia uh, decided to stay and uh, had a, a residency or a, an allowance to stay in Belgium made her eligible um, uh, for the fund. And so at the moment that we started to work on the film, I think Ottilia had already done a little bit of filming uh, with her friends, uh, which was actually quite convincing. Uh, I liked a lot uh, the story between the daughter and the mother uh there was a lot of emotion uh there was a lot happening in that room where one could also feel what was happening outside of the room so there there was a, a very cinematic uh value to what Otilia was doing um but of course I was only watching with Otilia parts of her footage and there was only part of it filmed but then when we uh, continue the filming, suddenly we, we started to struggle <laughs> uh, to make a longer film out of it. And that's also where the archives uh, became mm. part of it. Um, and that it's at that point, I think, that we uh, tried um, to submit uh, an application for script funding. Mm. Uh, I guess it's the case in a lot of European countries, but in Belgium, the system of financing is based on a fiction system which uh, is a very undemocratic uh, system in the sense that uh, for receiving money to write a script you actually need to shoot or to do extensive research with your own means uh, and you only get the money for the script once you actually have done the work, <laughs> which is a, a first uh, filter, you know, to uh, towards filmmakers. And it, it it's small. It it makes the group of people that are making films uh, very narrow. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. That's 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 a very interesting point that you're bringing because it that it's like that in a lot of European countries, actually. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and it also puts a lot of uh, authors and directors in precarious uh, situations because they are not earning nothing throughout uh, the process. So what I try to do as a producer is to start try uh, finding financing <laughs> as fast as I can so that the filmmakers are not waiting too long um, between doing research and receiving a little bit of funding so they can sustain um, themselves. So that's what we did on this film. And I think in the time between the uh, ending of the film school um, and uh, the first uh, script funding, there's a year and a half, Atelia, in which you were mm -hmm. also doing uh, the ESODOC uh, workshop, right? Right. On the right. Yeah. I think you started it even uh, before I before, came. Before, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, so I don't know if you want to explain ESODOC, Otilia. I think most of the people know about ESODOC, but yeah, it was the it was the kind of the first uh, training where we developed the the project. 
Uh, mm -hmm. But it was still, when we were in Isodoc, it was still in the phase, uh, in, it was still a film without archives. Yes. So at this stage, you had, you had started filming, um, you had the plan, so to say, you had done uh, a bit of development work with the labs, um, Isodoc, Exoriente, um, you had started fundraising. What happened next? Because at some point you mentioned uh, both that that it wasn't really working with what you with what you were filming. Did you just stop the proceedings and take a step back and go into into the thinking process again of of trying to reimagine the film, or was it something that can kind of came out of the filming and so on and the research that you were doing with the interviews mm -hmm. yeah i think um there was a moment when um when i felt that i like i was already i I felt a bit confused with the film I wanted to do because it's been long and it's been so I I needed to take a step back and uh, I think I did that for for a while I think we stopped so um and uh, I rewrote and I I sat down and I rethought uh, about the film I want to make and uh, we started the archive researching and uh, yeah I think there was there was a moment when and it was, I think, actually an important moment where when um, you like not necessarily need to continue and you say like we move forward because like that's but to take a step back and to to actually understand what's OK, things got changed. We understood that it's the film, it has to change as well um, and it will have to reshape a bit. So, yeah, I mean. After yeah, we we started uh, researching on the archives. We hired somebody in Moldova um, that was researching locally, um, and then I was doing the part of researching, uh, let's say, abroad in the Moldovan di diaspora abroad, which is a big community. Um, so the archives started uh, coming from uh, from Moldova. And uh, from abroad, from we posted a lot of announcements on the Moldovan groups abroad. And uh, yeah, I mean, um, of course, before that, uh, I, I already received a few archives, which uh, which convinced me that uh, that what I was actually searching was in these images, and they they had so much to to offer and so much. Um, it was exactly the opposite with the footage that I was filming and the footage that I was receiving, uh, that it was exactly there, you know, this memory of, of this phenomenon that I was searching for, it was there. And, uh, and I, I felt like I can do the film as, as I actually imagined before. And uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it's, it's important somehow to, to look to look back uh, and to build this uh, this memory of uh, of the past. Yeah, I mean, you have such a like the footage is is, is really incredible and it's so powerful. There are so many moments in there that are really really strong and and kind of revelatory. Um, so maybe for the audience, um, if somebody has not seen the film yet, we could show a little bit, a uh, small clip of the film. We have a clip to maybe introduce the kind of footage we're talking about. Um, we could see the clip number eight, maybe. <laughs> Mulțumesc! 
tot ce îți faci. So this is obviously such a Moldovan, like intrinsically Moldovan story, actually, that you're telling this, this story of parental absences, and especially the mothers who went abroad for work and for labor uh, reasons. Um, so I was wondering, you decided at some point quite early on to base it specifically in this mother-daughter relationship. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Um, Yes, as um, yes, if it's as it's the story of my friends, and I and I based uh, based the film and uh, what everything I made on the on the on the experiences uh, of my friends and and what I saw and what I saw they lived. Um, it was a uh, it was my decision to to focus only on mothers and daughters. I think it's also quite. Um, I mean the the relationship between mothers and daughters I think are are quite specific and uh, as somebody said it's one of the most complex relationships it it exists and uh, of course growing up as a girl it's um, we need the presence of our mothers in many moments uh, differently than than boys Uh, but of course, I mean, it, it was mostly because it's what I experienced and it's what I saw. And of course, I wanted to speak from from what I know. Um, so that's why uh, I decided to focus more, only on that. And and once that, that was um, clear as the focus of your story, because there have been films in the past already about the topic and there will be... I suppose many more films about um, labor-related migration coming out of Moldova um, for a couple of generations still. So, how did you how did you go about making the film different from existing ones? What what was what was um, how did you want to make it different? Mm. Yeah, I mean, there there are many things on uh, many films on the on the same topic, uh, and maybe I didn't see all of them, but uh, from what I saw, it's um, there were films made by foreigners in Moldova about the same subject, uh, mostly men. Um, I mean, I, I have a particular opinion about that, but that <laughs> for that we need another session. But um, yeah, I, I mean, from what I know, uh, it's the first film made about the topic of somebody that is local. Um, and I mean, bes like I didn't want to make a film that just illustrates a phenomenon. Um, I think I really was important for me to give something to these people and by that I mean like a, I hope at least that uh, through this film um, I gave uh, I I will give them a reason to start talking about it and I also think it's quite a powerful 
act to see yourself uh, on the screen and to to see that um, that it it was not only you who lived through this and there are many others and that is ex ex it's an experience that she, that is shared um, from almost half of the country and it's worth to start talking about it not just like watching and moving to the next film but to actually yeah i i hope i manage for this film to to give them something i'm i'm pretty sure you did um on that note did actually your original um protagonist already have a chance to see the film or are they still waiting to to see it not all of them but the um, one of the main protagonists was with us in Leipzig and so she she had the chance to see it and it was actually a very emotional moment I think for all of us and uh, um, and for her and for us um, I didn't know how she will react and uh, I think it was quite therapeutic for her and she she laughed, but she also cried during the film. So she she went through 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 different. She went like through a carousel of emotions uh, throughout the screening. And uh, yeah, she she was very grateful after. That's great. Um, I'm 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 thinking about. I mean, we've been talking a little bit already about how the film kind of changed shape along the way. Um. And obviously this is something that happens a lot in documentary. It's what documentary is about, about all the changes that you have along the way um, until you have a finished film in your hands. But in this case, it, it, it changed quite significantly. So I was wondering um, how that um, played a role also for you, Hane, in terms of production and was it difficult to to deal with it um, and to talk to the funders and 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 um, I I know we spoke a little bit about that at some point in some cases you actually had to go talk talk to the funds and have the funding reapproved yeah. uh, in a way so how difficult was that I think what what we try at our company is to make quite quickly uh, a kind of a pitch uh, teaser, which then is a a, a blueprint uh, of the film to come, um, and that's next to the paper and the writing that you need to do. It's uh, a nice exercise to do because you are working with the materials of the film, with the early filming. And uh, you work with the editor. Normally, that editor then will also be the editor of the film. So it's a kind of a test for the whole team uh, to come together and to agree upon the tone and the colors and the modalities. And in that sense, on this film, I think we succeeded that quite easily uh, to make a convincing teaser. So with the material of Victoria's friends in live action, not in uh, archives, and with some archives, we made a teaser and we pitched the film at uh, Thessaloniki, but also at Ex Oriente and got interest from sales agents there and uh, from festivals and from some broadcasters. And, um, and then we also received, with that teaser, we also received our production funding, um, which was an application that was uh, the story of Victoria and Olympia, the friends of Attilia. Um, uh, but in that sense, we also were uh, forecasting um, a, co a four-part co-production structure with the Netherlands, with France, uh, Romania, uh, and Moldova. Um, and on that basis, with a budget of around 400k, which would have included quite a lot of filming uh, in Moldova, uh, we received uh, our major uh, production financing and the financing works like that, that you first have to have your uh, major funding in place before you can go uh, outside of, um, of, of, of your country and search for additional uh, financing. So once we had the financing, we continued uh, filming because also that is in documentary, most of the times we are like, 
filming while we are financing and we are financing until the film is in into its final shape sometimes even when even after the film is done uh, so I always push my official photography dates uh, quite late in the process although we are already working together um, so I think uh, when we uh, decided to make uh, the break Otilia we we just wrapped actually uh, doing an assembly with a French uh, editor and uh, the idea was with that assembly uh, to go to the funders and the teaser and the assembly to go to the funders uh, ab abroad but uh, we had many difficulties with this assembly it um, of making the story that was in the trailer working to make it working a longer cut of 30 minutes that was our idea um, and we had many discussions with uh, Christine Camdessus, the French co-producer on it, uh, whether this was good and the editor. And actually, we, we got a little bit trapped in a way. We didn't know how to uh, continue. So that's where we uh, took a break. Um, but then after the break, as we decided that it would be only archives, the budget also changed considerably because we didn't need uh, to shoot so much. Uh, so we didn't need that much of international financing. And of course, when we say international financing, we say also that we need to kind of collaborate with different creatives uh, abroad of Belgium. So because of us not doing any filming anymore, the creative uh, team on uh, the film is quite uh, uh, reduced. So that also made the possibilities of collaborating with co-producers um, yeah, less possible in a way. Uh, so that's when we went back to our fund and we said, we are not going to make the film for 400, but here's a budget of 200 and here's the new financing. And please uh, send us the first amounts of funding because I have already spent half of the money. Uh, and then suddenly they said, oh no, this is, this is not okay. You cannot uh, change uh, uh, your film like that. Uh, this is not the film that we have funded. Uh, so you have to go to, back to the commission. <laughs> and that it's the first time in my career that that happens. <laughs> and it's I think it's the most terrible thing that can happen to a producer because once you start filming with a director and uh, projecting a film and, uh, you know, you, you need to be the person that is securing uh, the whole film and I, I I couldn't do it anymore like they took it away from me in a sense so there yeah. was a lot of uh, uh, quite uh, tough discussions with the funds uh, but they said to me you know what you can you I know you write very well just write a new application and submit it again to us uh, <laughs> uh, so that's what we did but at the same time, I was, I was, I really was afraid of, of, of not being able to continue the film, which would have broken my heart and probably that of Otilia as well. Uh, sounds sounds nerve wracking and like a lot of sleepless nights. Yes, <laughs> but you manage in the end, and also you manage to to keep it as a foresight uh, co-production. Yeah. So how did that? happen you have uh, belgium romania france and moldova in the end right no 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 we have uh, uh, the romanian fund we tried we submitted an application still on the basis of the story of victoria and olympia but we get, yeah. we weren't approved by the fund but it was also at the moment that the romanian fund was completely reformed uh, in terms of uh, politics so it was a bad moment i think uh, to apply um so in the end, actually, our fund in Belgium, they allowed me um, to gap finance myself with my company um, and to have a projection of a Dutch co-producer on board. Um, so they promised us again the financing, the production financing, which was great. Uh, so we continued the film and then we went to a Dutch co-producer. Um, because there's a collaboration between Belgium and uh, the Netherlands. And uh, we secured um, all the post-production of the image and uh, the sound post-production and uh, trailer. 
uh, in the Netherlands through our uh, co-producer there. Um, and I always say we have to kind of select uh, when you start a film and it's a co-production. I always try with my directors to select uh, the members of the family that we want to keep. And of course, for a first time uh, director, that's a difficult thing because yeah. he has been making films on her own in the Doc Nomads and hasn't had uh, the task to collaborate and doesn't know the, the Belgium uh, landscape. So we, um, yeah, we were in touch with quite a lot of editors. Uh, and then we were also in touch with quite a lot of possible sound uh, editors and sound mixes. And in the end, I think we managed to uh, to have the creative team uh, that is uh, the best for this film, which were all quite sensible uh, people that could completely follow and support the vision of Atelia, because doing a film with archives, uh, I think, is a, is, a, is a big challenge to make a sense without it being historic or narrative. It's quite a, a, a challenge, I think. And that's what our fund also told us. Uh, yeah, that's a great introduction to Pier Paolo right at this moment, um, who has been patiently waiting for us to <laughs> bring him into okay. the discussion. Uh, thank you for that. So I would like to know, and I think the audience would like to know as well, um, how that collaboration started between between you two, Otilia and Pier Paolo, and how you kind of built the report with each other and the, and, and the working mode in the editing room. How did that go? Who wants to start, Otilia? <laughs> you can go for it. Yeah. I mean, I I met Otilia already since some uh, time before uh, we started working together. I knew she was doing this film, but uh, uh, I don't know at the beginning, uh, she was not, um, I don't remember what was the thing. She was uh, uh, the beginning looking in there for some uh, um, Romanian speaker uh, editor. And then uh, I got... Um, uh, a message from uh, Otilia and Anne for having a Skype and uh, also uh, an assembly of 30 minutes that they uh, pre-edited with um, I think the, the editor Anne was uh, talking about and since the, since the very uh, the very beginning of this uh, cut which is the, the still the beginning of the film so this scene with the birds in the little uh, cocoon and uh, so I was super attracted and uh, I loved already this this uh, this project this film and it was also uh, a lucky coincidence because uh, when they uh, I was not uh, at the beginning was not uh, available in the period they needed but somehow uh, another film uh, had to move and there was this possibility to to work together so um, uh, yes this is how it started and uh, uh, we started from this 30 minutes of assembly as a mood board all the um, key scenes i would say were there like the most uh, emotional ones uh, were there but maybe not already in the right place and uh, so um, I asked uh, Otilia to make a pre-selection of all these uh, archives. And uh, I think I, I received uh, um, 60 hours maybe from these uh, 100. I didn't have to watch all of them. I mean, I watched all of them, but Otilia was subtitling the parts that were interesting to, to see. So I was already guided into all these hours of, uh, of rushes. And then we, um, I invited Otilia after I watched all these uh, hours and I proposed there uh, a new structure as a, as a starting point. And from that, we started cutting together. Yeah, when I was when I was talking with with Otilia in, in preparation, she mentioned that you were um, actually giving her homework, which which I loved, like the, the, the dynamic of, of you sending her homework to prepare 
for the two of you to work on in in the editing room ah, you, you mean yeah you mean the, the subtitles yeah because I think it's it's useful for the director to make this work of na giving names to the footage, in, uh, identifying scenes, because, you know, you have this magma and you have to start to uh, make some uh, order in it. And uh, this is an effort that uh, then uh, help also the director, I think. Like for writing a dossier, a pager, it's the same type of uh, approach. Yeah, definitely. So if I understood it correctly, you, Otilia, were the one who watched through all the archive materials that you collected? Of course, of course. And yes. it was and it was uh, 100 plus hours, if, if, if I remember. So how long did it take to gather all those materials? I think... I think all in, I don't know. I mean, we started in around um, around 2018 to to gather footage, and I think when we were editing, we were still receiving. Uh, so it was it it took us a while. Um, they they didn't come all all of a sudden in one batch. They were coming like in different periods different quantities and uh so i was everything i was receiving i was watching i was making notes i was uh i was printing screenshots and uh, putting putting them on my wall and uh, as the footages were arriving the also building the structure on my wall as i would imagine the film uh based on the based on the feelings of my friends that were evolving during these years so um yeah but of course um what i build on my wall and uh, and what happened in the editing room are two different stories because of course you what you build on the wall is just in your imagination and you think it's gonna work like in theory let's say and uh, then of course during the editing uh, they uh, i mean they are so alive that it's such a um, that they sometimes just uh, take you to different places and uh, ha I mean they show you another way sometimes so yeah we had to embrace that yeah and for you it was also the first time working on a project that was entirely archive based Pier Paolo if I understood it correctly yeah I think so I think so it's uh, but in any case uh, uh, it's um the approach we had with these archives uh, is also peculiar in general because normally when you have archive uh, films, uh, even films that are made only by archives, uh, there is the voiceover, for example, with the driver. And uh, the, um, the archives goes as a counterpoint or uh, as an illustration. No, I think I remember that Totilia was... Uh, um, was having uh, this film as a reference. Uh, uh, what was what the name again, Otilia? The Portuguese film? No, the Brazilian one. Uh, ah, the Brazilian, sorry. In the Intense Now. In the Intense Now, where you have the voiceover as a driver, except that Otilia um, at the beginning was trying not to have even a voiceover at all. But uh, so the challenge was to approach this archive as a uh, footage just footage so to edit with a narrative uh, uh, aesthetic let's say and uh, to make them live and stand on their uh, on their feet and this for me was very challenging and, and thrilling because uh, this is also the way i prefer to 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 cut to to look for the emotions and for the um, truth that that there is in the in the in, in these moments uh, uh, of real life. So this was um, yeah this was the first time anyway for me to work with uh, uh, an archive it, for sure in this in this uh, in this way. No, and I think it, it actually works beautifully. Like like the material you have, um, the footage and the film has such a such a strength actually it's 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 really powerful so it works beautifully and then you had like the kind of 
twist a little bit with the with the role of the mother in the film, which was your way to to build in some sort of voiceover and narrative. So maybe we can talk a little bit about how how that um was created that the figure of the mother or like the mothers in plural because it's like the sort of collective mother figure in the film which you created how how did that um work mm. yeah there are, there are actually many things to say about that um and there are many things that led us to to this um first i think um was the fact that in the in the footage that we received, um, there are a lot of children and um, these images were sent sometimes by the children, sometimes by the mothers. But um, we, I noticed that in these 100 hours that I had, it was, and some images were, were indeed shot by the mothers in the countries where, where they left to, but they would uh, not so often show their face. Uh, they would film their surroundings. Uh, they would uh, they would speak, but they would not film themselves. And uh, this was, I mean, I had I had a few images of of mothers, but n not so many. So I um, this was somehow um, even let's say dictated by the footage as well, and um, and then by the yeah the fact that they decided to stay invisible and they were invisible in uh, in uh, as a presence in children's lives but also in the footage we received so i decided to keep it like this uh, like the the invisible mother as a character as a um, yes as a, as a character in the film and um and then uh, we had uh, <laughs> with pier paolo a lot of discussions about uh, and with Hanya as well about how for me it was uh, this thing of uh, how much information do I have to uh, offer uh, for the subject to be understood and I I wanted uh, a lot of this information to be clear from the from the footage itself from the film that we are going to do but of course I I understood that I have to give some information as well for to to give a, a, you know a context to 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 all this phenomenon. So um, then again, mother uh, as an invisible character, but uh, uh, that could offer this information, uh, not only information, of course, but uh, but also some some information about her her state of mind as well on the other side. So um, yeah, I mean, I I build um, the the mother as a as a character in the film through um, yeah, it's it's first of all a co a, co a collective uh, character uh, that is built from uh, the interviews I I made with them, uh, the the footage I had with uh, with um, my friend and her mother. Um, and a lot of stories I gathered. So I, I created one single collective story and I wrote the voiceover. And because I somehow felt throughout these years that I, I, I heard so many stories, so I, I allowed myself to, to actually um, be that, uh, let's say, um, yeah, have embodied the voice of the mother in the film. So yeah, that that's how we did it. I think it's it's a beautiful counterpoint because you have on the one hand, of course, the kids um talking to us um from the footage in a way, talking to us from the from the past, but then the mother feels much more like somebody who's talking to us from the present in a way. They like like they kind of exist in different planes somehow. And I think that the tone of the mother is much more reflective. So I think it's a very it's a very nice combination. It works well to to give that that well-rounded feeling to the film. Um, so I was wondering also um, and we have some uh, the question as well from the audience um, about um, the advantage slash disadvantage question mark um, of having an editor in the film that who on the one hand um, comes from a different country as Moldova um, 
and also is a man um, where the story is focusing so strongly on mothers and daughters. So what was the experience with that for, for, for the two of you, both Otilia and, and Pier Paolo? Who starts again? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I'm as an editor, I'm used to enter in other worlds uh, that, that are not mine all the time in all the films. And I'm so glad about that because in this, you know, algorithm era we live, we are constantly mm, closed in our little uh, world and uh, jumping and having the possibility to access other stories, other worlds. It's, uh, it's something I'm so lucky to have in my daily experience. And then, I don't know, I just focus on human beings and I think that feelings and uh, even archetypal relation are uh, quite the same in, in, in any case. I don't know if it was an advantage or a, a disadvantage. <laughs> Maybe ask Otilia, she was looking actually for a female editor before uh, working <laughs> on me. So maybe she can tell why she... <laughs> Yeah, no, it's true. I was actually, I, I I was looking for a female editor and for me it was important that this film is going to be edited by, by a woman because I, I thought that is important. Um, and, uh, but, you know, in the end, I, uh, and after working with Pier Paolo and talking to him and, and that's how I actually uh, decided to, to work with him. In, in the end, it's about... Uh, a person's sensitivity to a subject and to, to, to not to, towards a subject, but in general, a person's sensitivity and that doesn't, the gender doesn't matter uh, as long as uh, you have that sensitivity and that um, understanding of a subject. Uh, so yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think from, from this point of view, we, we, we worked quite well in the end and it didn't matter that it was a man or a woman. Were, were there any points where you did not agree on the structure in, in a significant way or how did you manage, manage to overcome that? Um, of course, we had disagreements and it's normal to be like that. And it's actually important to be like that because that's how uh, that's how actually good, uh, good things uh, uh, come true. <laughs> Uh, but I don't remember uh, uh, like a major thing. I mean, the major, f I don't know. Um, I think I'm very, the way I want to tell stories uh, and the, the way I, I want to make films is somehow very, um, very discreet, let's say. And I, I was very reticent in giving a lot of information, um, both in voiceover and in, and in images, I, I I think it's really important to give this space for for audiences to to actually um, make their own film when they are watching without like feeding with a lot of information. So, but I didn't have enough distance to to understand how much of information I should give or or take. So I think we had a lot of discussion on this or on 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 this how much, but. But actually, info like a, a lot of information. Yeah, how how much background? Let's say I, I should give away. So yeah, but maybe you can say more, or maybe you remember something else. No, no, I remember that there was something that you um, that you didn't want for your film, so that was clear. And uh, for I, I remember that in general you were avoiding uh, anything that will sounds and look a bit cheesy. Also, <laughs> so this. This is why we didn't use uh, uh, music or sometimes, but this was your concern. And actually, I agree, but it was just a matter of finding the good balance for all, already also giving uh, access to the audience to understand uh, our, uh, our film and the kids' drama. Um, you yeah, Oh, something sorry. that we it was not a disagreement but something that was um quite challenging editing was um uh, was to try to find actually moments of uh, moments of silence and uh, to actually build silence in the film moments were of reflection and where you can 
just um, yeah like allow for the film to sink in and this is something that um, it's a challenge actually editing with archives uh, because um, of course we when we are shooting we we know that we are like pressing the button and we are waiting a bit and then the action starts or I mean we we are search we are kind of looking for this moment of silence when we are when we are shooting but when people are making um, family archives, they are pressing the button when something is happening or when somebody's talking or there is an action happening right there and they stop when that action finishes. So most of the images we received were very intense in in sense of uh, that and and there was no, no room for silence in the in these images. So um that that was um something that that we struggled a bit too and sometimes we actually um created these moments of silence um, um maybe even artificially somehow or yeah but uh, but it was important to have them in a film that it's so um so full of emotions and sometimes they're very strong yeah, I mean, we were talking about it earlier as well, like how there is this sort of performative quality to home videos and, and to private like videotapes a lot of the times, but over time, it actually manages to break through in the film that, that you have those really intense moments of truth um, that kind of reveal themselves. Um, and, and then you, you have like that, that different quality in the material when those moments of truth happen. Um, you wanted to add something to the to the topic, Hanne, I think? Yeah, I, I, I was just going to go back to your question about whether it was an advantage or a disadvantage that Pierpaolo is not from Moldova. And I would say that the big advantage, of course, is that in a way he didn't know the context. So in the editing room, Otilia immediately needed to explain the context uh, to Pierpaolo, to explain the backstory. And then, of course, by having all these conversations between them in the editing room, I think in the end, it also made it quite easy and straightforward to then also put it in, in the picture. And I think that also allows us to make a more international film in a way. Uh, from a Moldovan uh, context. But of course, the disadvantage, as we have mentioned, is that all the Russians needed to be translated, uh, that Pierre Paolo was quite dependent on Otilia for that. And we didn't have enough budget to kind of pay a professional translator to go through all these Russians. So Otilia worked uh, quite a lot on that. Um, but it allowed her also to see all the Russians and to kind of think about them up front and I would add that the big advantage of Pier Paolo was that he was agreeing to have an editing that could be stopped uh, when we were uh, kind of not seeing how to go forward have a pause and then take it back uh, again a couple of weeks later so it's not an editing that went like three months clack up front and then the film was was there it's an editing that went over a year and we had to stop many times, uh, reevaluate, rethink, research other archives. Um, so uh, I, th I think for this film, of course, for many documentary films, it's important. But for this film particularly, I think it was important to kind of get the right distance to the material back again once they have were in for a couple of weeks in order to continue editing. Yeah, sounds like a really very effective um, setup, actually. It sounds like a dream setup that you take the time to like take the, the step back and, and reflect on what, what's happening in the editing room. Um, yeah, and if I can add something about this thing of the subtitles, actually, uh, I think that this method can, can, can work of uh, asking the director to subtitle. It happened already in another in another uh, case for me that the director was subtitling and I think the advantage in this case is that it co already gives you directions and and tells you somehow how where is the focus for the director 
uh, while when it's a professional, it just translates everything, and then um, we have less of this uh, guidance. So I think it could be a, a sort of method uh, in uh, in future if you want. Yeah, yeah, and subtitling one hundred hours of Russian by professional is yeah. <laughs> Huge benefit. So often we end up with a lot of different people translating rushes, and then very often the quality of the translations are so bad that anyway, you yeah. Need... And right now I'm this kind of project. Uh, I've been there many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it it also forces you to go into your material with a very different perspective, and like the the like your interaction with the material is uh, an entirely different one if you have to subtitle everything but of course it would be good if there was like a you know like a, a perfect setup where everything is um, um is, is possible within the budget and the quality of the translation and the subtitles is the same at the high level for every piece of every piece of footage especially with this kind of amount uh, which is significant um What's happening with the film now, um, now that it is released? It was in Leipzig. It's, uh, it's, 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 in, it's in the world now. What's happening? Um, we will have our UK premiere in two weeks at London Film Week. And uh, we are happy that it's already sold out. <laughs> And um, then um, there will be um, a screening in Moldova in December. And I'm really looking forward for, to that because there are a lot of people that are in Moldova that contributed to this film and that gave us their images and they didn't see the film yet. So that's also quite exciting. And uh, yes, then we, we have some other news that we cannot share yet that we will very soon and and maybe just to add to that Otilia, the film is is being distributed by a, a, a sales agent so they are trying to sell the film but haven't uh, been able but for us uh, the most important thing is now to be able to show it around the world at film festivals and also i think to invite the moldovan Uh, communities to come and see it so we'll be also setting up something in brussels uh, in collaboration with the embassy very nice we have uh, some questions from the audience coming in and i think we don't have like a lot of time left ah we still have a bit of time so maybe we can go back to a couple of questions um that we're getting for example There is a question, um, since you were all free to create the whole story structure, um, working with the archives, um, were the, were the, was there a point where you had like different endings in mind and what, what were those options? <laughs> yes, actually, um, yes, um, I did have another ending in mind. I mean, um, in sense that, um, I had an ending in mind that I imagined and um, uh, and I was waiting uh, for that ending to come in the archives that I was receiving, which of course it's, uh, it's a bit uh, um, naive somehow to think that, uh, that you, you receive that in... Anyway, um, yes. Um, yeah, about that... Um, I think, uh, and this happened in not only regarding the ending, but uh, with other things in the in the editing as well. Um, is that sometimes uh, we just had to to rewrite the story in the editing with the material we had? Uh, because of course you can imagine something, but if it's not there, then you have to work with what you have. And this was something that even though we were still receiving uh, images while editing uh, at one point we had to say that that's what we have and uh, and even though we think that it's not enough but we have to work with with what is there and uh, 
Um, and that's how uh, we actually created another ending for the film, uh, an ending that was in, in the archives, but it just needed to be refought a bit. And um, and yeah, I mean, it was reinvented, let's say, uh, based on, on the footage we had. Yeah, you have to listen to the footage uh, and to accept what is there. You know, I remember in the dossier I read from Otilia there was a different ending. Uh, two, two things, uh, actually. Uh, a, a sort of, I don't know if I can say, uh, sort of rebellion of uh, uh, the adolescence part of the daughters. Uh, and also there was this desire of Otilia of coming to... The present so with a new type of uh, communication between um, mm. mothers and daughters and, um, and then there was the house as well sorry the house remember <laughs> yeah the, yeah the house no the boxes this these yeah. are part of the film so yeah, this exactly. were something that is part of the phenomenon or the context or the background but effectively was not uh, recorded or was not in the archives that uh, we received uh, but yes this I uh, want to just add something about uh, uh, the the coming to the present uh, we had actually archive about that but this archive was uh, like whatsapp um, calls or uh, whatsapp videos uh, and uh, the, in, in, nowadays the communication and also the relations uh, completely changed because they can uh, they can have an instant communication. They can communicate actually. They cannot. They don't have to wait anymore for these tapes to arrive in months. No, but uh, somehow uh, it was not our story. So uh, for us, when the when the daughters stopped to film was the natural point of end of the story and uh, then as Otilia said we had to uh, work on that to to make it an end it cannot feel just an, an abrupt uh, uh, end of a, of a film uh, like that and uh, we have to thank uh, Miguel <laughs> because he is the one who cuts the very last uh, scene of the of the film which brings uh, a bit of brightness and uh, maybe some uh, some uh, glimpse of uh, these adolescents that uh, Otilia was uh, looking for. We have such a lovely, lovely um, comment from the audience, which is not a question, but I, I'm going to read it um, because I think it it um, goes very well in connection with, with us talking about the ending. So... Nicolina has said, very touching film. I cried together with the little girl who stopped from singing. It took me back in time when our mother left. I never thought that my story was so similar with so many other kids' stories. When we were living in Moldova during that period, I felt that no one could feel and understand my pain. Now I understand that there were many kids like me. We were just keeping it silent. I think that's such a powerful, powerful um, comment and also I think on the one hand you have made such a Moldovan film Otilia but also it's a film that a lot of people in other places can relate to because you have this phenomenon in a lot of regions as well similar you can go to Latin America you can go to a lot of places in Africa you can go to a lot of places in Asia you have this similar story of, of parental absence and, and labor-related migration, which I think lots of people around the world will actually feel a strong connection to. Um, so I think the film has a bright future in terms of connecting with audiences around the world. I hope you will have a nice, nice festival, festival career with it. Thank you very much. That was beautiful, and uh, yeah, what uh, what a better way to end it than with with such a, a comment. And um, yeah, you're right. It's true. It's happening in in other countries as well. And 
And uh, I think it's not only about the mother's absence, but also about the um, the the way we actually communicate today um, sometimes, and that uh, sometimes when we don't know how to how to actually tell to our loved ones that we love them or how to actually share um, our feelings, we sometimes replace them with objects and. Uh, we, when we are not there or we don't know how to say that we care about them, we tend to to offer things. And uh, I think it's also about that. Definitely. It's 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 also a crash crash course in capitalism, which which Moldova in a way went through um at that time in the in the early 90s and, and to, towards the 2000s. I think that's also a very powerful statement in the film. Yeah. Was there something um, that you, each of you, learned um, for yourselves during the process of making the film? I mean, every single film that we make as filmmakers, we all learn something, I don't know, about, about our craft and about storytelling and about the world we live in and about ourselves. So what was the one thing that, that you guys learned during the process of making the film? <laughs> I don't know I mean um, many things um, and somehow um, I feel that there are still many things to learn um, uh, well like while, while we were showing the film I also felt that uh, um Yeah, uh, anyway, um, I don't know. I, I, I think that uh, I, I learned to trust the, like, to be, <laughs> how should I put this? Um, to believe in my ideas, even when, uh, like, people say they're impossible. Uh, and that it, there is certain ways to do films and uh, that um, I think there is this tendency to put all the all the ideas and all the stories in a box uh, because like this they sell or because like this it's how the narrative works or because you know many things like that and uh Many times people were saying that this film is not possible to work, you know, and um, I I think I was stubborn to to continue uh, to believe that it will. Uh, and even if it wouldn't, uh, I will make the film that I believed in. And so I think um, uh, when I was watching it and during the premiere on the on the screen, um, Uh, I feel very grateful for that, and uh, yeah, and I actually want to thank Hani for, and I told her that um, thank you for letting me make the film I wanted um, that I had in my head, which is very important. Hani, Pier Paolo, any personal lessons <laughs> learned? I, I maybe for me, it's one of the films that took me the longest because we started talking in 2015 and we are 2022 and of course COVID happened mm -hmm. so a lot of things got uh, delayed but it's seven years you know <laughs> uh, so I got wiser in a way throughout <laughs> the film and uh, but I think we had a lot of fun together and there was a lot of trust um, together uh, that was needed to make this film. And also, I think for this film, I had to be very patient, um, but I was also put under pressure, like I said, by the funds, um, by the tax shelter uh, system. Once we launched it, we only had 18 months to do all the spends, which is the rule here. And we actually didn't finish. So we had to come up with creative solutions on how to go with that, how to how to make sure that we are okay in legal and administration terms, but at the same time, we keep the 
creative liberty of making the film at the pace that is uh, the right one for us. Um, so that that was quite of a challenge, and I think we I learned uh, to be a little bit more patient. I think. Yeah, I learned a lot of things as in uh, in every film. I I don't know now what to say is something special, but I just wanted to thank uh, again uh, Otilia and Anne for uh, for uh, 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 welcoming me on on this beautiful film, and it was really a privilege for me. And uh, yeah, just that I mean they know we we say this. Uh, I said to them already a lot of times I think, but it was really a privilege for me to work with Otilia and uh, with Dane. Great, thank you so much for for reflecting on 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 the lessons of the of the path uh, you took together. I I I think we have like just a couple of minutes left, so. If somebody in the audience has a question they need to to get out of their system, that's the moment to do it now. Please hit it, hit us up with your questions. We we still can answer a couple more, I think. Um, but in the meantime, I was wondering what's next for you, Otilia. Are you working on the next film now? Already? What's it gonna be? Uh I don't. <laughs> um, I think it took a lot of time and a lot of my uh, my energy, and I I need a moment to to. And anyway, it's um, I I started making this film because uh, you know there was something there that I I felt I had to to take it out and. Um, and I don't have this right now. And I, if something like this, a subject that will, that I would have this urge to to do or to to tell, then I will make another film. Uh, and if it won't, then I will not. I don't. I I will not make another film just for the sake of making my film or for the fact that I have to, uh, to make it another one right now. Um, I think. Um, I don't believe in in making fast uh, fast food films, and uh, I, if I will make another one, it will probably also take me a long time because I understood that's how my process. Maybe that's another thing I learned that I I understood to respect my process, and my process is is long. Um, that's that's the way I, I I do it. I think I I I give my subjects time because I think they need it. Um and yeah, I mean, I, um, only if it will be something that will, um, that I I would feel that I can give it another many years of my life, and it will be something, uh, yeah, that will hurt or tingle. You are creating a lot of hype now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it was not. It's not on purpose. <laughs> That's that's how life goes. Sometimes things that are not on purpose are oftentimes the ones that <laughs> end up end up changing our lives forever. Um, while we wait for the audience, maybe for a couple of minutes to come up with final final questions. Really, use the chance. You have Hane and Otilia and Pier Paolo here. They are amazing. They made an amazing film. <laughs> get your questions out there um but while we wait i was um also wondering um like from a production perspective Hane, i mean we talked a little bit about the struggles um when the film changed and the kind of things that happen when you have to go back to the source and, and, and discuss the, the proceedings with the funders and things like that. Um, but what was for you like the biggest challenge apart from that with this project? Oh. <laughs> I, I think we got quite easily uh, money during development and, and production. But I also think that while we were making the film, the politics... Uh, were changing as I said already in Romania I changed and then 
In Belgium, we have a more and more right-wing government that also influences the way the funds look and at films. And so I think uh, while we were uh, going through the development and production, I think our fund came up with the idea that they need to have more um, narrative, easy documentaries about Belgium topics uh, made by uh, Flemish filmmakers. Mm. Um, so, of course, that also changed and put a little bit more challenge uh, on us in the way that we were not at all doing that. <laughs> and although, of course, we have these criteria for diversity and female filmmakers, and of course, there the film completely taps into it. I have to say that, for example, getting the Belgian broadcaster on board on this project was uh, not possible anymore. Probably in 2015 it was, but when we were ready actually to show the assembly, uh, they changed uh, politics. So I think that is, of course, a, a, a big challenge. Um, and I don't think we would have had the same funding if we would have said from the beginning that we were doing an archive film so maybe it was good that it went the way it went because financing a film that is completely based on private archives of people that are in four by three you know the format uh that's quite a, a, a special and a unique uh, point of view which i adore uh, mm -hmm. but it's not what is uh, being searched on in for in the industry or not what is being uh, promoted by our fund so that was i think uh, the biggest challenge for me yeah yeah i can imagine um we have just one final 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 question which came in at the very very beginning of our discussion um but maybe it's a good one to 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 finish the session today um Somebody was asking, Otilia, um, whether your original short film, your graduation film, that was the starting point of, of, of the entire project, um, whether it is available to, to be watched anywhere. Uh, actually, it's not, but maybe it's not a bad idea to make it available. <laughs> so I will consider that. Good. I think we don't have any more questions left. Um, I would just use the opportunity to thank the three of you a lot for having this conversation with me. Um, thank you for the film. It's it's really beautiful. I really I really love it. Um, and thank you, Hanne, for going through all these challenges and struggles and and actually making a film based entirely out of private archives from Moldova, being a non-Moldovan producer, I think that's that's really, um, it's, it, it's a really important film. And I think it's a really strong statement to actually go and produce it. <laughs> well, I want to thank Cotilia as well, because it was such a nice uh, collaboration with her. So the thanks goes <laughs> to Cotilia. <laughs> Good. Um, closing statement, Otilia? Uh, well, um, I mean, I if mm, I would like this people this film to reach as more people as possible, and um, I would like for it to go to to all the places where where there are Moldovan communities and not only. So yeah, I mean, I, I hope it reaches and it touches as most people as possible. Great. I think with that, we can actually, we can actually finish the session. Thank you so much to IDF for making it pos possible, for having, for having the team here behind the film talking about it. Um, it was a pleasure. I hope everybody in the audience got something out of it. Um, and I would say go watch the film if you get an opportunity and then maybe we can continue the conversation at some point somewhere else in the festivals um, online, wherever you meet Otilia. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.